Hello everyone. Welcome to the first class of A level physics paper 5 crash course. Students paper 5 consists of two questions. First question is called the planning question. And second question is called the analysis, conclusions and evaluation question. But I'll refer to it as graph question because you have to draw a graph in it, right? Okay, each question carries 15 marks. So that makes our paper 5 a paper of total marks 30. Now, average grade threshold for an A grade in paper 5 is 21. And you can always score 21 marks very easily. Actually, you can always score 26 out of 30 in paper 5. But to do that, you'll have to learn some rules. Rules, methods, and some tips. So, in this 5 lessons crash course, I'll be teaching you all the rules, methods, formulas, and tips that cover both questions of paper 5. Planning question and graph question. Right? Okay, kids, let's look at the question of paper 5 now. Uh, we will look at graph question first. Because graph question of paper 5 is a question in which you can always score full marks. 15 out of 15. And to score full marks in this question, you have to know 24 rules. 24 rules slash methods slash formulas. So all together, there are 24 rules, methods and formulas that we have to learn to cover all parts of graph question of paper 5. But the good news about these 24 rules is they are all mathematical. And you can say that no physics is involved here. Right? And one more plus point about these rules is you don't have to learn them from scratch. You have learned most of them in AS. For instance, you have learned 16 of them in AS. And now you only have to learn 8 new rules. Rules that you have learned in AS include rule for determining expression for gradient and y-intercept. Rule for determining number of significant figures in the calculated quantity. Likewise, rule for calculating uncertainty. Rule for plotting point. Drawing test, fit line, etc. Right? And the rules or methods or formulas that you have to learn now that are new to you include three logarithmic identities. Rule for determining number of decimal places in the calculated quantity of a logarithmic function. Then method for drawing error bars. Method for drawing worst acceptable line, etc. Right? So these are the new rules that you have to learn to cover the remaining parts of graph question. Now kids, we will cover these rules one by one. I'll teach you this rule first, for example, and then we will do only those parts of graph question in our workbooks where that rule is used. And then we will move on to the next rule, then to the next, and that way we will cover all 24 rules in the first three lessons of this crash course, right? And by the time we learn the last rule, we will have done all parts of all four graph questions of the work. And then we will move on to the planning question. Planning question is a relatively difficult question. Why? Because to do planning question, you should have sound knowledge and understanding of principles and laws of physics. Moreover, planning question can come from any topic of physics, from AS or a2 slippers. And the common topics from which planning question comes are mechanics, DC circuits, magnetism, EM induction, alternating current. So students, we will be doing one planning question on mechanics, two on DC circuits, one on magnetism, one on EM induction, and one on AC current. In the fourth lesson, we will cover these two topics. And in the fifth lesson of this crash course, we will cover these two topics. In planning question students, we have to uh, obviously plan an experiment. To do what? To test a relationship between two quantities. But before that, we have to choose one quantity as our dependent variable and one as independent variable. That is called defining a problem. After defining the problem, we have to write our plan to collect data, to analyze data. And as we write our plan, we have to include additional details in our account. And then in the end, we have to state at least one safety precaution. 
obviously to do all these we have to learn some rules but another problem with planning question is there's no definite number of rules that cover all parts of planning question why again because planning question can come from any topic of physics it can come from optics from uh, superposition from fluid dynamics from nuclear physics these are just the topics planning question usually comes from right but again i'll tell you all the important rules plus i'll teach you some very important tips to write additional detail points so that you can always write at least four additional detail points in your plan right okay so students after learning all these rules and tips i'm sure that you'll be able to score at least 11 out of 15 in planning question it doesn't matter the planning question comes from any topic other than these five topics if you learn those rules and tips i'm sure you'll be able to score at least 11 marks out of 15 in your planning question so students this was the brief introduction to paper 5 let's now start our lesson formally so kids in this lesson i'll first of all explain to you the structure of graph question students it is very important that you know and fully understand the structure of graph question because in paper 5 total time allowed is 1 hour and 15 minutes and you should always start your paper 5 with graph question because graph question is relatively easy but it is time consuming so you should try to finish it within 45 minutes and spare at least 30 minutes for your planning question which is question 1 of paper 5 and this is only possible if you know and fully understand the structure of graph question that will save you a lot of time and you will never feel lost while doing any part of graph question after that i'll teach you one method of determining expression for the radian and y intercept from the given equation after learning that method we will do part a of one or two graph questions in the verb book and then i'll teach you three logarithmic identities and after learning these three logarithmic identities we will do part a again of one or two graph questions in the workbook because in some graph questions doing part a requires the use of these three logarithmic identities and in the end students i'll teach you two rules for writing column headings and then we will do just a section of part b of one or two graph questions in the workbook right Let's start with the structure of graph question. To explain the structure of graph question, I'm going to consider the second graph question in the verb book. And the second graph question in the verb book is about stationary wave formation. Now students, we know that stationary wave formation is a topic in the AS physics syllabus. And let's say, just for argument's sake, that you have forgotten everything about stationary waves because you learned stationary waves last year in AS. Still students, I'll say that you don't have to panic. You can still score full marks, 15 out of 15 in graph question. Because like I told you before, graph question does not require knowledge and understanding of laws and formulas to learn in physics. It only requires knowledge and understanding of rules and methods that are purely mathematical in nature. So graph question, it mostly consists of five parts. A, B, C, B, and E. And it always starts with the description of a physical phenomenon or a situation. So this graph question, it starts with the description of stationary wave formation in a resonance tube. So we have been given in the question that there is a tube which is partially filled with a liquid. This is air column. This is a tuning core of frequency f it is vibrating and producing sound that travels with speed v down the tube and at a certain length b of air column in the tube resonance occurs that is antinode forms at the open end of the tube and when that happens f frequency of the tuning fork and d length of the air column in the resonance tube they are related by this equation four times d plus k is equal to v over f 
students remember that in the graph question, the equation that applies to the situation is always given to us. We don't have to write our own equation. It is always given to us. And not only that, the dependent and independent variables are also identified for us always. So in this question, B is the dependent variable and one over F is the independent variable. Because D is to be taken on the Y axis and one over F on the X axis. And K and V in the equation are constant. Now students, in A part of graph question, which is always for one mark, we are always asked to use this information and determine expressions for gradient and y-intercept. Now, to determine the expressions for gradient and y-intercept, we always bring the given equation to y equal mx plus c form. And from that equation, we can easily determine the expression for gradient and y-intercept. I've already done that for this question, and this is what I got. The expression for gradient turned out to be v over 4, and the expression for y-intercept turned out to be minus k. So students, remember that in A part of graph question, we are always asked to determine expressions for gradient and y-intercept. And to do that, we always use the given equation, bring it to y equal mx plus c form. And from that equation, we determine the expressions for gradient and y-intercept, right? Next part is part B. And this part usually carries two or three marks. Students, in part B of graph question, we are always given an incomplete table and we are asked to fill it out. So in this graph question, we have been given a table of three columns. The first column has six values of F, where F is the frequency of this tuning fork expressed in Hertz. So first value of F is 320 and the last value of F is 512. Second column has six values of B, where D is the length of air column in the resonance tube expressed in centimeter. So for F equal 320, the corresponding value of B is 24.5 plus minus 0 0.5, where plus minus 0 0.5 is the uncertainty in the value of B. And for the last value of S, F equal 512, the corresponding value of B is 15.0 plus minus 0 0.5. And the third column is blank. And we have been asked to calculate and record values of 1 over F in the units 10 to the minus 3 second. Now see students, 1 over S is the function of S. So we can use these values of F in the table to calculate and record in this blank column the values of 1 over F. Right? So let's note that the heading cell of the column is blank. It is not usually the case. Usually the quantity, the values of which are to be calculated and recorded in the blank column is stated here. But if it is blank, it means that now we have to write column heading for this column. So let's write column heading for this column first using standard conventions. 1 over F over stretch mark and unit of 1 over F R and to the minus 3 second. Now, for F equal 320, 1 over F is equal to 3.13 times 10 to the minus 3. And for the last value of F, F equal 512, the value of 1 over F is 1.95 times 10 to the minus 3. Students writing column heading earns us one mark and calculating all six values correctly and then stating them to appropriate number of significant figures also earns us one mark. But students, B part of this question is missing something. In B part of most graph questions, we are not just asked to calculate and record values of a quantity and that's it. Rather, we are also asked to include uncertainties. And including uncertainties also earns us one mark. But we haven't been asked to include 
uncertainties in the calculated values of 1 over f. Why? Because see, the values of f don't have uncertainties. Therefore, we haven't been asked to calculate and include uncertainties in the values as the values of f don't have uncertainties. So students, in B part of graph question, we are always given an incomplete table and we are asked to fill it out and we do that by using the information and values already there in the table, right? Next part is part C. And part C may have three or four subparts. C part 1, B part 2, B part 3, and C part 4. Students remember that if the expression for y intercept in the graph question is 0, then C part has three subparts. But if the expression for y intercept is not 0, like in this question, y intercept is equal to minus k, then C part has four subparts. Each subpart carries two marks. So C part as a whole carries six or eight marks, right? Now, in C part 1, we are given a blank graph grid. And we are asked to use the values of dependent and independent variables from the table and plot their graph on the grid. But students, good thing about C part 1 is the axis of the graph grid are not only already labeled, but also calibrated. So in this question, the dependent variable axis starts at 14 and ends at 25. An independent variable axis starts at 1.9 and ends at 3.3. So, in C part 1, we don't have to choose scale for any of the two axes of the graph grid. All we have to do is use the values of dependent and independent variables from the table and plot points on the graph grid and draw error bars for each point. But students, this part of graph question is very time consuming. It takes up most of your graph question time because you have to plot points and draw error bars for all six sets of values of dependent and independent variable in the table with an accuracy of less than half a small scale on the grid. And this is something that cannot be done fast. However, next part, C part 2, can be done quickly. In C part 2, we are asked to draw best fit line and worst acceptable line. And this can be done in less than 30 seconds. In C part 3, we are asked to determine the value of gradient of the graph and its uncertainty. Likewise, in C part 4, we are asked to determine the value of y-intercept of the graph and its uncertainty. Students, I have already determined these values for this question and this is what I got. Value of gradient of the graph came out to be 8000. Uncertainty in the value of gradient of the graph came out to be plus minus 900. Value of y-intercept of the graph came out to be negative 0 0.60. And the value of uncertainty in the y-intercept of the graph came out to be plus minus 2.26. Right? Next part is part D. It also carries two or three marks. To understand the structure of part D, we will have to look at the equation given at the start of the graph question. See students. At the start of this graph question, we have been given this equation. In this equation, t is dependent variable, k is a constant, v is another constant, and 1 over f is the independent variable. In d part of graph question, students, we are always asked to determine the values of the constants, their uncertainties, and their units. Now, to determine these things, we need expressions for constant. The problem is, we don't know their expressions yet. Actually, in D part, we always determine the expressions for constant. Students, you should remember that to determine the expressions for constants in D part, we always use expressions for gradient and y-intercept from part A. And then to be able to determine the values and uncertainties in constant, we always use values of m gradient, uncertainty in gradient, y-intercept, and uncertainty in y-intercept from C part 3 and 4. 
Look, students, this is part A. And these are the expressions for gradient and y-intercept that we determined in part A. M is gradient, V is constant, C is y-intercept, and K is another constant. We use these expressions to determine expressions for constants. So, this equation gives us this expression for constant V, and this equation gives us this expression for constant K. So, K is equal to minus C. We use these expressions for constants and these values of m, delta m, c and delta c that we determined in c part 3 and 4 to determine the values of constants v and k and their uncertainties. I have already done that for this question and this is what I got. V came out to be 32,000 centimeter per second. Uncertainty in the value of v came out to be plus minus 4000 centimeter per second the value of k came out to be 0 0.60 centimeter and the uncertainty in the value of k came out to be plus minus 2.26 centimeter so students always remember the in graph question to do part d we always use expression from part a and values from c part 3 and 4 right now let's look at the structure of the last part of graph question, part E. This part also carries two or three marks. Students, in part E of graph question, we are always given a value of dependent variable that lies outside the graph grid. For example, in this question, we have been given that if D, which is dependent variable, is equal to 31.0 plus minus 0 0.5 centimeter, then Determine the value of F for this value of D and percentage uncertainty in the value of F. Now see students, value of D is 31, which is clearly outside the range of the graph grid. So we cannot use graphs to determine the corresponding value of F and then percentage uncertainty in the value of F. So in this part, to determine the value of F and percentage uncertainty in its value, we will have to first obtain an expression for f. So students in part E to obtain the expression for f, we always use the original equation. And by original equation, I mean the equation given at the start of graph question, this equation. So we use this equation to obtain an expression for f in terms of v, d and k. And then to be able to determine the value of f and percentage uncertainty in its value, we use the values of always, we always do this, we use the values of constants v, k and their uncertainties from part d, from the previous part. See students, these are the values of constants v and k that we determined in part d and this is the original equation. So, in E part, we use the original equation to obtain an expression for F first in terms of constants V and K. And then we use the values of constants V and K that we determined in part D to determine the value of F and its percentage uncertainty. I have already done that too and these are my results. F came out to be 253 hertz. And percentage uncertainty in F came out to be 21%. So this is the structure of E part of graph question. Right? Now listen students. I have already told you this before. And I am going to tell you this one more time. It is very important that you know and fully understand the structure of graph question. Because it saves you time. And you never feel lost while doing any part of the graph question. For example. Let's say you are doing part D. Now, if you know that in part D, we always use expression from part A and values from C part 3 and 4. Then you will not panic or look around. Rather, you will straight away go to part A and use the expressions from part A and values from C part 3 and 4 and do your part D. Similarly, if you are doing part E, and you know that in part E, we always use original equation and values from previous part, part D, 
then again you will not panic or look around rather you will straight away go to the original equation choose the equation and the values from part d and do your part e right okay students let me now quickly show you how many and what rules methods and formulas you have to learn to be able to do different parts of the graph question of paper 5. Let's start with part A. See students, to be able to do part A of all different types of graph questions, you have to learn one method of determining the expression for gradient and y-intercept and three logarithmic identity. Next part is part B and to be able to do part B of all different types of graph questions, you have to learn two rules for writing column headings three rules for determining number of significant figures in a measured or calculated quantity, one rule for determining number of decimal places in the calculated quantity of a logarithmic function, two rules for rounding off a calculated quantity, and one very important method of determining uncertainty of a quantity. Next part is part C. And to be able to do all parts of part C of all different types of graph question, you have to learn all together eight methods. One method of plotting points, one method of drawing error bars, one of drawing pestrate line, one of drawing worst acceptable line, one of determining the value of gradient of the graph, one of determining the uncertainty in the value of the gradient of the graph, one of determining the y-intercept of the graph and one method of determining the uncertainty in the value of y-intercept of the graph. Next part is part D and to be able to do part D of all different types of graph question, you have to learn one method of determining unit of a constant quantity from its expression. And last part is part E and to be able to do E part of all different types of graph question, you have to learn two methods of determining the percentage uncertainty in a quantity. So see students, all together there are 24 rules, methods or formulas that you have to learn to be able to do all parts of all different types of graph question of paper 5. Now, what I plan to do is that I'll teach you method, rules and formulas to this point in the remaining time of this lesson and in the next lesson that is in the second lesson of this crash course, I'll teach you rules and methods up to this point. And in the third lesson of this crash course, I'll teach you the remaining rules and methods that is up to this point. So students, in the first three lessons of this crash course, we will cover the graph question of paper five. And in the last two lessons, that is lesson four and lesson five, we will cover the planning question of paper five. Let's start with the method of determining expression for gradient and y-intercept. These students, you must all be familiar with this form of linear equation, y equal mx plus c. This form of linear equation is called gradient y-intercept form. We actually use this form of linear equation to determine expressions for gradient and y-intercept in part A of the graph question. Let me explain the structure of this equation to you first. See students, on the left hand side of the equation, we have dependent variable. And on the right hand side, we have two terms. One term contains independent variable x. And the other term is constant. Now, you should remember that the term which is constant and adds to the term that contains independent variable gives us expression for y-intercept. And in the term that contains independent variable, the constant part m gives us expression for gradient. So, this is how we determine expressions for gradient and y-intercept in part A of graph question. We first of all make dependent variable subject of the equation from the given equation and then we look on the other side of the equation and identify the term that contains independent variable. Now the constant part in that term gives us expression for gradient and the other term which is constant and adds to the term that contains independent variable gives us expression for the y-intercept, right? 
Let's do an example now. See students, this is part A of second graph question in the workbook. It is suggested that F and D are related by the equation 4 times D plus K equals V over F where V is the speed of sound in air and K is a constant. Part A says a graph is plotted of D on the Y axis that is D is our dependent variable against 1 over F on the X axis. So 1 over F is our independent variable. Determine expressions for the gradient and y-intercept in terms of k and v. Students, we know that to determine expressions for gradient and y-intercept from a given equation, we have to bring the given equation to this form. y equal mx plus c. That is, we have to make, first of all, dependent variable subject of the equation. Now, dependent variable is d. So, let's first of all make d subject of the equation. That is, shift 4 and k to the other side of the equation. Shifting 4 to the other side of the equation gives d plus k equals v over 4f and shifting k to the other side too gives d equals v over 4f minus k. Now d dependent variable is in its place and on the other side of the equation we have two terms. Now we have to identify the term that contains the independent variable. Independent variable is 1 over f and this is the term that contains 1 over f. So let's separate 1 over f from the rest of the term first to determine the expression for gradient. So v over 4f can be written as v over 4 times 1 over f and the other term on the other side of the equation is minus k that adds to the term that contains 1 over f. So it can be written as plus minus k. Now students v over 4 by which 1 over f is being multiplied gives us expression for gradient and the other term on the right hand side that adds to the term containing 1 over f gives us expression for y intercept. So v over 4 is the expression for gradient and minus k is the expression for y intercept. Students note that you cannot write k as expression for y intercept here because it is minus k that adds to the term containing 1 over f. So if you write k here, you will get 0 in this part, okay? Let's run three logarithmic identities now. Students, first of all, note that there are two types of logarithm that we will be dealing with in paper 5. Common logarithm, which is denoted by Lg, it is logarithm to base 10. And natural logarithm, which is denoted by Ln, it is a logarithm to base e. E is actually Euler constant, its value is 2.718 and it continues but you don't have to remember this because this type of stuff is not tested in paper 5. However, what you have to learn are these three logarithmic identities or properties. The first logarithmic identity or property which is also known as product rule of logarithm says that log of a product of m and n can be written as log of m plus log of n. That is, log of a product of two quantities can be simplified as log of one quantity plus log of the other quantity. Second logarithmic identity or property, which is also known as quotient rule of logarithm, says that log of a quotient m over n can be written as log of m minus log of n. That is, log of a quotient can be simplified as log of numerator minus log of denominator, right? And the third logarithmic identity or property, which is also known as power rule of logarithm, says that log of a power function, m raised to the power n, can be written as n times log of m. That is, log of a power function can be simplified by moving the power out front. So when we move the power n out front, this is what we get, n times log of n. Students, all these logarithmic identities hold true for natural logarithm as well. And they are used in part A of graph question. Because in some graph questions of paper 5, the given equation is not linear. For example, look at this equation, y equal m raised to the power x. Now this equation is not a linear equation because it has a power function. 
So in such situations, we use logarithmic identities to form from this equation a linear equation first. And then we bring that linear equation to y equal mx plus c form so that we can determine the expressions for gradient and y intercept, right? Now see students, besides these three logarithmic identities, you should also remember these three points. Number one, log of n is equal to one. Similarly, natural log of e is equal to one and natural log of e raised to the power x is equal to x. Students, we can actually show that right now that this function reduces to x. Let's do it over here. Natural log of e raised to the power x. Now, according to the power rule of logarithm, the power can be moved out front, right? So this function can be written as x times natural log of e. Now, what is natural log of e equal to? Natural log of e is equal to 1. So, x times 1 is equal to 1 and hence natural log of e raised to the power x is equal to x. Right? Let's do an example now. This is part A of third graph question in the workbook and the question says it is suggested that y and i are related by the equation y equals s times i raised to the power r. See students, this equation is not a linear equation because it contains power function i raised to the power r. So this equation cannot be brought to y equal mx plus c form, right? The question continues where r and s are constants. Part A says a graph is plotted of log of y on the y-axis, which means that log of y is our dependent variable against log of i on the x-axis and log of i is our independent variable. Determine expressions for the gradient and y-intercept in terms of r and s. Now see students, we have learned this in the previous example that to determine the expressions for gradient and y-intercept, we have to first of all make the dependent variable subject of the equation. Now dependent variable is log of y. We have to first of all make log of y subject of the equation. But the problem is log of y is not there in the equation. So students, we have to first introduce log of y into this equation if we want to determine the expressions for gradient and y intercept. Let's take log of both sides to introduce log of y into this equation. Log of left hand side is equal to log of right hand side. Log of s times i raised to the power r. Now look at the right hand side of the equation. It is log of product of s and i raised to the power r, which means that the right hand side of the equation can be simplified by using product rule. Let's simplify it first. Log of s plus log of i raised to the power r. Now look at this term. This term is a log of a power function, which means that it can be simplified further by using power rule. So let's simplify this term now. Right hand side now becomes log of s plus r times log of i. And left hand side is log of y. Now in this equation students, log of y is our dependent variable. See, log of y is our dependent variable. And on the other side of the equation, we have two terms. Now, to determine the expression for gradient and y-intercept, we have to first identify the term that contains independent variable. Independent variable is log of i, and this is the term that contains log of i. So, log of i, which is our independent variable, is in this term. Now, in this term, the constant part, r, by which independent variable is being multiplied, is gradient, and the other term on this side of the equation, that adds to the term that contains log of i, the independent variable, is the expression for y-intercept. So, gradient of log of y versus log of i graph is r, and y-intercept is log of s. Right? Let's now learn rules for writing column headings. So, yes, there are two rules. And they are both very simple. So according to the first rule is, see the quantity V 
which is to be expressed in units 10 to the 3 meter per second. Then column heading for V should be V forward slash mark and units of V 10 to the 3 meter per second. So the rule states that the column heading should contain both the quantity and its units and they should be separated by a distinguishing mark, for example, forward slash mark, right? Now, according to the second rule, if there is a logarithmic function, let's say log of V this time, where V is to be expressed in the units meter per second, then column heading for log of V should not be log of V forward slash mark meter per second, Rather, it should be log bracket open v forward slash mark meter per second bracket closed. Now, the reason why this heading is wrong is that it suggests that the units meter per second are the units of log of v, which is not true. Meter per second are the units of v only. As for log, it is a mathematical operator and it has no units. So a quantity V for example may have units but log of V has no unit. Let's do an example now. Students this is part B of the first graph question in the verb book. Part B says values of P and H are given in figure 2.2. These are the values of P. These are the values of H. Write column headings for 1 over H in the units per meter in figure 2.2. So quantity is 1 over h and unit is per meter. So column heading should be 1 over h for search mark per meter. So students, this little example brings our first lesson to an end now. I tried my best to keep things to the point and avoid unnecessary details. I'll see you in the next lesson soon. Until then, take care and stay blessed.